I'm back to talk about more Oz stuff. The last time I focused on the first Oz book and the classic beloved film, this time I want to talk about the movie Return to Oz and the second and third books which were the basis for it. Return to Oz was released in 1985 after many of the Oz books started becoming public domain. It's a loose adaptation of The Land of Oz and Ozma of Oz. It's a logical successor to the classic film since it continues where the story left off. Nothing could ever top the classic, and this is not an official sequel, but you can view it as an honorable follow-up. They actually paid a fee to MGM to use the ruby slippers. As a kid, I had no idea these two movies were made almost 50 years apart from each other. I just figured one came right after the other. The first one was child-friendly, except for some frightening moments, but when I got to Return to Oz, Holy shit! This movie steps into much darker territory. There's no song and dance, no bright colors, no cheerfulness. This one is a nightmare come to life. Lots of people share the same memory of seeing it at a young age, thinking it was going to be a fun romp through a wonderful land of imagination, and instead coming face to face with a trauma-inducing mind bender that almost qualifies as a horror film. It begins with Dorothy, all alone, spending the night in a psychiatric clinic. Everything's dark, there's the sound of rain and thunder. I think you could even hear people screaming in the background. She's strapped down to a table and given electroshock therapy, and if that's not terrible enough, there's also this creepy nurse who keeps coming in who offers no kindness to make Dorothy feel any more comfortable. Then there's a power outage, and a strange girl comes in to help Dorothy escape with the nurse chasing behind. She travels down a river, and next thing she's talking to a chicken named Belina, and the chicken talks back. In the context of everything we've seen so far, the most natural conclusion would be, Dorothy has a mental disorder. And that brings the whole Land of Oz into question. The first time it's implied at the end that it was all a dream, but this time, right off the bat, they're making Dorothy seem like she's out of her mind. When she gets to Oz, the somber tone continues. There's no munchkins to greet her, nothing. Just when you're looking for some levity, she finds Oz is destroyed. The yellow brick road is overgrown and the Emerald City is in ruins. The Tin Man and Cowardly Lion are turned to stone, and the Scarecrow is being held captive by a giant rock monster called the Gnome King. Then, Dorothy's being chased by these masked maniacs called the Wheelers who ride around with wheels on their hands and feet. They never really do anything to Dorothy other than scoot up to her and laugh in her face. But that was enough. This was one of the scariest moments in the film. There's also a place in Oz called the Deadly Desert, a forbidden zone where anyone who touches it will turn to sand. That always creeped me out too. So then Dorothy meets a new set of friends, Jack Pumpkinhead, who's made of sticks, and a robot named TikTok. They help Dorothy try to rescue the Scarecrow. They go to a princess named Mombi to help, and at first she seems like she might be nice, but then she turns out to be horrific. She has a collection of disembodied heads which decorate her hall. She has the ability to take her own head off and switch it with any head she chooses. Well, she wants to add Dorothy's head to her collection, so she imprisons her in a chamber. Dorothy's only means of escaping is with a magic powder that she tries to steal from Mombi. The powder is sitting next to one of Mombi's heads, so when she takes it, the eyes open, the head starts speaking some magic mumbo-jumbo, and then all the heads in the hall come to life and start screaming. At the same time, the headless body of Mombi rises from her bed and starts coming after Dorothy. There's something about the music, the screaming heads, the headless body, all that combines to create the scariest moment in the whole film, with the wheelers being second. When it comes to traumatizing moments from your childhood films, this ranks very high for me. She uses the powder to bring to life the head of an animal called a gump, which they attach to a sofa and other parts. The group all hop on and the gump flies away and they escape. They go to the Gnome King and ask for the Scarecrow. The Gnome King is an interesting villain. His true form is an old man in a throne, but he can sort of morph his body into the rocks as if all the mountains in Oz are a part of him. It's really cool, and all throughout the film leading up to this, we've seen his minions who appear as faces in the rocks. It's all done through some kind of stop motion, which still looks amazing to this day. The Gnome King gives Dorothy a chance to rescue the Scarecrow by playing a game. The Scarecrow was turned into an ornament. 
He lets each member of the group go into the ornament room, and they have three guesses each to figure out which one is the scarecrow. When they fail, they're turned into ornaments themselves. This scene is full of tension and suspense, and it culminates in the Gnome King transforming into the rock monster. The stop motion effects are lit by flame, and it looks like a complete manifestation of hell. Needless to say, the Scarecrow is rescued, the Tin Man and Lion are restored back to life, and the true ruler of Oz, Ozma, is returned to the throne. The last thing I want to point out is the Scarecrow. Instead of makeup, they use this silly mask or animatronic face or whatever, so every shot he's in, he has this frozen smile. It doesn't matter what else is going on, he's just standing there smiling like a dumbass. That just tickles my funny bone. Anyway, Return to Oz is brilliantly shot and well-crafted. As an adult, I appreciate the darker tone. I think it's the second best Oz movie and will always have a place in my heart. Now, I promised I'd talk about the books. I didn't mean to spend so much time on the movie, but I don't think as many people have seen Return to Oz as much as the original, so it was necessary. Anyway, on to the books. Land of Oz, here's book number two, also known as The Marvelous Land of Oz. The first thing I noticed about this one is that Dorothy and the Lion are nowhere to be found, but there's lots of new characters. It centers around a boy named Tip, who is a slave to Mombi, an unofficial witch in practice. But she's not the same Mombi as in Return to Oz. This is another instance like Glinda, where they took two separate characters and combined them into one movie character. This was Mombi from Land of Oz and Princess Languideer from Ozma of Oz. I'll get to that soon. Tip tries to play a prank on Mombi by making a twig person with a pumpkin head, but instead Mombi brings it to life with her magic powder and it becomes Jack Pumpkinhead. Jack and Tip become friends and escape. Tip steals the magic powder and brings to life another character called the Sawhorse who's made of logs and sticks. The Sawhorse always argues with Jack. They trade funny insults all the time. If these two were in a movie together, they'd be the comedy relief. They go to Emerald City, where the Scarecrow is now the king. When Scarecrow first talks to Jack, Jack says they will need a translator because he comes from a different place and speaks a different language. So the Scarecrow brings in a translator, but the translator deliberately translates it wrong to make it seem like Jack is insulting the Scarecrow. But lots of times Jack and the Scarecrow say things directly to each other, and you're wondering, how does this work? Everything's written in one language, but then you realize, the author is playing a joke. Of course they're both speaking the same language. How could they possibly say, I speak the language of the munchkins. What do you speak? Oh, I speak the language of the pumpkin heads. We need a translator. Yes, let's get a translator. It contradicts everything. And then the translator finally lays it down and says, you're both speaking the same language, you idiots. So Jack apologizes and says, he assumed since they came from different places, they probably speak different languages. Then the scarecrow says, you shouldn't assume things. Better to be a silent fool than to try to think without brains. This is great humor because the Scarecrow in the original story began with no brain. So now that he has it, or so he thinks, he flaunts it like he has superior intelligence, but really, they're both just as foolish. It's my favorite part of the book and I think it would make for a great movie scene. The Emerald City is overtaken by an army of women led by General Ginger. The group escapes and goes to the land of the Winkies, where they find the Tin Man is now Emperor. See, after the Wicked Witch was killed, each of the characters became the leader of different sections of Oz. One thing that really confused me is about halfway through, they start calling the Tin Man Nick Chopper. I must have missed where they first established his name, but anyway, from this point on, he's Nick Chopper. They go back to the Emerald City, but on the way they meet the highly magnified, thoroughly educated Wogglebug, a giant bug that talks sophisticated. He makes puns and says that to pronounce a joke that allows double meaning of a certain word is a sign of a person with a thorough command of the language and shows culture and refinement. The rest of them think puns are stupid and old. They argue about it until the Tin Man subtly threatens him with the axe. But if your superior culture gets leaky again, he did not complete the sentence, but he twirled his gleaming axe. Then there's a long pause, and the bug says, I will endeavor to restrain myself. <laughs> Couldn't you see this in a movie? 
They go back to Emerald City, drive out General Ginger, but then they question who is the true rightful heir to the throne of Oz, and they get paranoid that Ginger's army will return, so they plan another escape. So they conquered them, but now they're running again. And this is where they create the thing with a gump's head, which is what it's called. They never even explain what a gump is exactly. It's left to your imagination. By the way, the palm leaves they use for the wings are sacred in the Emerald City, and the penalty would have a person to be killed seven times and then put in prison. Killed seven times and then put in prison. Jack is the one with the idea for using the broom as a tail. He insists that if it has a head, it needs a tail. Everybody else thinks it's unnecessary, but Jack argues that they need the tail. Even when they're putting on the magic powder and they're in a rush to escape and all this stuff is happening, Jack keeps saying, don't forget the tail. It's kind of like a Three Stooges moment. After the gump comes alive, he's embarrassed that he's a sloppy hodgepodge of different things. He would be ashamed if other gumps saw what happened to him. He helps the group out by flying them around, but he's reluctant and bitter. At the end of the book, the gump has Ozma take him apart as his reward. So it's basically suicide. They all go back to the land of the south, meeting Glinda, and then finally they go back to the Emerald City again, defeat Ginger, and capture Mombi, who knows the true location of Ozma, the real heir to the throne. Well, it turns out that Mombi had transformed Ozma into Tip. So all along, the young boy Tip, he was Ozma. Wow. What a twist. Then we have book number three, Ozma of Oz. This is the one that Return to Oz took the most material from, so the majority of the movie happens in this book. Dorothy returns and once again is the central character. There's the Wheelers, TikTok, and the Gnome King. Also, like I mentioned before, there's Princess Languideer with the switchable heads, called Mombi in the movie. In the book, it's made more clear that she can be good or evil depending on which head she's wearing. So in the book, she's actually good more often. She still traps Dorothy and company in her palace, but afterwards, she's nice. The real villain is the Gnome King. The Gnome King is basically the same character, except he doesn't transform into rock. He's just an old man with a beard like Santa Claus. So that's all the basics. If you've seen Return to Oz, that's pretty much what the book is. But here's some of the differences, the ones I feel worthy of highlighting. TikTok has more of an origin story. He was built by two inventors, Smith and Tinker, who disappeared afterwards by very strange circumstances. One of them painted a picture of a river so realistic that he fell and drowned in it. The other made a ladder up to the moon and stayed up there. They could have just had heart attacks or something. That would have been simpler. But hey, that's creative. It also establishes that the story doesn't actually take place in Oz. It's in the land of Ev, or Eve, which is across from Oz, separated by the impassable Deadly Desert. There's a tiger who is the funniest character by far. He's just a tiger that's always hungry. He's kind of like Shaggy and Scooby-Doo, who are always thinking of food. All he talks about is how hungry he is, and keeps mentioning that he needs to eat a baby. A fat baby, specifically. He admits that it's terrible. He feels ashamed of it, but he can't stop bringing it up. Could you imagine the hungry tiger in a movie? Always like, oh, I really need to eat a, a fat baby. I know, it's, it's terrible. It's ter I'm sorry. It, it, but really, I need to eat a baby. Oh. Another thing I found humorous was how long the ending goes on. After they defeated the Gnome King, they have to reestablish the royalty in the Emerald City, putting Oz back on the throne, appointing generals and captains and shit, and it goes on and on. In the movie, it's quick. Gnome King's defeated, friends are rescued, peace is restored, the end. But the book doesn't know when to stop. And this got me thinking. Stories always begin and end whenever it's convenient. We like to pretend stories are real and actual worlds that we sort of eavesdrop in on, as if the window to this world opens up to us just as it's getting interesting, and as soon as things are resolved, the window closes. This is almost playing a joke on that, like, let's see how long we can keep that window open afterwards. And this got me thinking, what if there's a story that begins way early, Let's say it's a movie. Let's say it's Forrest Gump. What if the movie starts out with him sitting on the bench for an hour in real time before anything starts happening? 
If I had the time, I would make a feature film that's 12 hours long, but the actual story happens in the middle and is only about an hour and a half. That's where all the conflict happens, but the beginning and end, it's just casual, like nothing's going on. Imagine what that would be like. Anyway, that's Ozma of Oz. I don't have as much to say about this one because most of it is in the movie. There's plenty more Oz books, but I think you get the point. The point is Hollywood has not yet taken advantage of all these books. Of course there is Emerald City, which is a mainstream TV show on NBC. I just saw the first episode last Friday. I went into it with a fresh mind. I didn't know what approach they were going to take with it, if they were going to adapt the books more closely or what. And after seeing it, I can say this. It's a very different interpretation. It's set in modern times. Dorothy's a nurse who happens to be in a police car when the tornado takes her to Oz. The police dog becomes her Toto. She helps a man who she finds hanging on a cross. A crow lands next to him just to remind you of who he's supposed to be, the scarecrow. Even though he's not a scarecrow, he's a human. And instead of being literally brainless, he has memory loss. That sums up the show's agenda. It's reimagining the characters to make them more realistic, which I think takes a lot of the fun out of it. It's a bit like the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, how they took things that began in comic book form that were far-fetched and imaginative and stripped them down to what they might be like if it were real life. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I have mixed feelings about it. Emerald City clearly takes place in a fantasy world where magic exists, but it feels very restrained. And literally, the wizard in the story is putting an outlaw on all magic. The characters are not adaptations of the Oz characters, they're just some kind of equivalent of them. It's almost like a game to guess who's supposed to be who, and then you stop and wonder, does it even matter? Take the Oz references out of it, and this could have been any other dark, brooding, adult fantasy TV show. Clearly, it's not trying to adapt the books, and that's fine. The books are like fairy tales. You can tell them and retell them in many different ways. So I can see the desire to update it for modern audiences, but this draws much more influence from Game of Thrones than the Oz stories. It's watchable, there's nothing really bad about it, and it is only one episode so far. Personally, I'll be watching more of it. I'm glad it exists as proof that Oz is never forgotten but I'm still waiting to see faithful adaptations of all the Oz books as a major motion picture series. Mm -hmm.